Hi everybody, my name is Jim Reed and I'm a geologist and programmer at Rockware. Before we get started, there are some important things to point out. This is the first in a series of 30-minute Rockworks 2021 training webinars. We will be posting dates and times for upcoming training webinars at www.rockware.com slash webinars. We're doing this to avoid bugging people with constant emails. The webinars will cover the material that was historically presented during our two-day in-person hands-on training class. The training manual can be downloaded at the URL shown at the bottom of this slide. You won't need it for this webinar, but it will be necessary thereafter. That's because the training manual has step-by-step hands-on exercises. These exercises are meant to demonstrate and reinforce what is presented during the webinars. Yes, this is our attempt to deal with the COVID travel and congregation restrictions. We'll be recording these webinars and uploading them to the web, and we'll forward the video URLs to the attendees as soon as they're uploaded. If you've got questions or comments, please type them into the chat window and we'll address them either during or at the end of each webinar. Or if you want, we can mail you with more detailed answers. Finally, we're assuming that everybody already has a Rockworks license or the trial version, so we'll skip the sales pitch and focus on learning. So let's dig in. We'll start by describing some of the more important and useful items within the interface such as the little plus and minus buttons, draggable tabs, menu groups, tabs within tabs, the favorites tool, the search tool, embedded documentation, the example button, and adding items to the playlist. Many of the Rockworks programs, including the main menu, are littered with little plus minus buttons. The reason for these buttons has to do with real estate on laptop screens. We've simply run out of space. Ideally, Rockworks and many other applications should be used on multi-screen systems, but we appreciate that many users are limited to single-screen laptops, so the little plus-minus buttons are a compromise. On the other hand, the horizontal tabs can be dragged to other screens. In this example, I start out by reorganizing tabs within screen 1 and then I start dragging tabs onto a second monitor. These configurations are automatically saved or you can create multiple layouts for switching between different configurations. Rockworks programs are organized into four categories being borehole related operations, model related operations, miscellaneous utilities, and graphics related operations. Some of these programs read data from a relational database, while others read data from simple data sheets. Some read data from both. By the way, notice how program abstracts are displayed as the cursor is moved over a given item. Most of the Rockworks application menus consist of nested tabs. Back in 2020, we switched from a tree structure, as shown on the left, to these tabbed menus to provide more space for longer descriptions and helpful information. Extra post-processing tasks are eliminated via additional options within the programs that generate maps, sections, charts, and 3D diagrams. For example, if a solid model is being created, additional features may be added at the same time, such as 3D strip logs, an air photo draped over the ground surface, an arrow mag map floating above the model, control points plotted as proportionally sized spheres, a perimeter cage, a legend, surface and subsurface infrastructure, and 3D faults and other 3D files that have already been created. In the event that a menu is being crowded by the help messages along the right side, a vertical slider bar may be adjusted to decrease the width of the help messages, or they may be disabled altogether. Rockworks application programs include an option at the top labeled Favorites. This button will add that particular application 
to the Favorites pull-down menu located at the top of the main Rockworks menu. This helps to minimize searching through the menu list for commonly used applications. Speaking of searching, the search option located at the top of the main Rockworks menu can be used to find programs whose descriptions contain one or more search terms. The search can be configured to use a sounds-like algorithm that allows for inexact matches. For example, a search for contour, C-O-N-T-U-R-Z, will find all applications that have the word contour, C-O-N-T-O-U-R, within their descriptions. Once the results have been listed, clicking on an item within the list will provide an extended description of the application. Note that these descriptions provide a road map to show where the application can be found within the menu hierarchy. Right-clicking on an item within the list will present a sub-menu that can be used to either launch the application or add it to the favorites list. By selecting the AND search type, the results will be limited to applications whose descriptions contain both terms. For example, a search for the word model will return 206 results, while a search for lithology will return 23 results. But, a search for lithology model will return 14 results. All of the Rockworks program menus include embedded documentation with hyperlinks for additional information about specific topics. Some of this documentation also includes step-by-step -step instructions for processing the sample files. Programs that read data from the Rockworks datasheet, which I'll describe in a few minutes, include a button at the top right labeled Example. If you click on this button, one or more file names will be listed. Clicking on a file name will automatically load the file into the Rockworks datasheet. This eliminates the hassle of navigating through the 611 sample files that are included with the program. It also provides a template that you can clear and use to enter your own data. The Rockworks application menus include an item labeled Playlist. Clicking on this button will add all of your menu settings to a list of commands that can be executed in a batch fashion. The settings for any command within the playlist can be changed by double-clicking on a given item and editing the menu accordingly. The playlist is one of the most useful and powerful options within Rockworks. We'll be covering the playlist in greater detail during a subsequent training webinar. The project folder, located at the top of the main menu, defines where your data is stored. This means data that Rockworks will use to create models, diagrams, and analyses, as well as the output files created by the program. Most of the exercises used within the subsequent training webinars will use the data within the Rockworks Samples folder, which is automatically created when the program is installed. When you create a new project folder, you will be prompted to enter the project folder name. In this example, we'll call it Refinery A. Next, you will be prompted to select the coordinate datum and zone if you specified UTMs or state plane coordinates. At this point, the Refinery A project has been created and you're ready to start entering or importing data. Now, if we use the Windows File Explorer to look at the new Refinery A folder, we'll see that a subfolder titled System and a file called refineria.sqlite have been created. Never ever mess with the files in the system folder. Also, note that the name of the database must be exactly the same as the project folder name, so don't change it. When saving or loading files, we strongly recommend that these files be saved within the project folder. The program will assume that any file names that don't include folder paths are in the project folder. This makes everything much easier 
because you won't be constantly navigating through folder hierarchies. So just remember, don't alter the files within the system subfolder. Don't change the name of the project database SQL Lite file and save all of your data within the project folder. Note the project dimensions tab just below the project folder line. The minimum and maximum project dimensions define the size and location of the maps and 3D models that you'll be creating within Rockworks. These units are based on the coordinate system specified during the creation of the project or later on using the coordinates tab. If you want to double check your coordinates, click on the Google Earth option to display your project extents within Google Earth. If the project boundary shows up in the wrong place, you'll know that something is wrong such as the coordinate system or the min-max specifications. Fixing the problem when initially setting your project dimensions will save a ton of time before wasting energy making bad models and diagrams. The XYZ spacing defines the resolution of the 2D and 3D models. These spacings determine the size of the grid cells and the solid model voxels. More about that in a few minutes. Now let's move on to data management. The Rockworks datasheet provides a simple way to manage data that can be organized into rows and columns. If you don't feel like manually typing in your data, the datasheet import menu contains lots of tools for importing from a variety of formats, including ASCII text files, Excel files, and ArcMap files. And you can always use the Windows clipboard to copy-paste. Now, let's take it up a notch by looking at a relational database. Remember that SQLite database file that I created a few minutes ago? Well, the Rockworks Borehole Manager uses this database to store and retrieve borehole data. It's a big improvement over trying to use data sheets for real life projects, but it's a bit more complicated. Let's walk through some examples showing the borehole database tables and how they're used. We start off with the borehole names that are listed along the left side of the screen. As the cursor is moved from one hole to the next, the tabs on the right display a variety of information about that particular hole. The programs within the borehole operations menu group read the data from the borehole database in order to create models, diagrams, and perform miscellaneous analyses. For example, the borehole map program will read the borehole location table within the database to create a map. The orientation table is used by all of the programs such as the 3D strip log application to convert depths to XYZ coordinates. The lithology table is used by programs such as the lithology solid application to create block models of discontinuous lithologies. The stratigraphy table is used by programs such as the stratigraphy fence application to create 3D slices depicting laterally contiguous units. I data refers to any quantitative downhole data such as geochemistry. As with everything else, it can be block modeled and displayed in a variety of ways including 3D ISO surfaces, cross sections, and fence diagrams. Similar capabilities exist for time-based data such as t-data, point-based data such as downhole geophysics, colors, fractures, water levels, and hydrocarbon production. Graphs, strip logs, and cross sections are displayed within a 2D utility called Rockplot 2D. This program includes tools for editing, exporting, and importing 2D graphics. 3D diagrams are displayed within a utility called Rockplot 3D. In addition to editing, exporting, and importing, Rockplot 3D can be used to rotate and convert the diagrams into animations. Most of the Rockworks applications embed either the Rockplot 2D or the Rockplot 3D engines directly within the submenus. This means that you only need to learn how to use these two tools 
to manipulate the output from any of the other RockWorks programs. Gridding refers to the process of superimposing an imaginary grid over your project area and estimating the value of each cell midpoint based on the control points. Grids can be displayed as contour maps, 3D surfaces, or profiles. The size of the grid cells determine the resolution of the model. The resolution determines the size of the smallest feature that can be identified. Make your cells too big and you lose resolution. Make your cells too small and it takes longer and produces larger files. A good rule of thumb is to set the cell size to half of the average minimum distance between your control points. The estimation of these cell values is called gridding. All programs within RockWorks that generate grid models provide the user with multiple algorithms that can be used to estimate the grid cell values. Trick question. Which algorithm is best? Well, that's like asking which field tool is best. Measuring a strike and dip with a rock hammer or an acid bottle is not going to produce a good result. Just as attempting to break a rock with a brunton is going to produce a bad result. Now grids aren't just used to make pretty pictures. In this example, we've filtered sand thicknesses greater than 40 feet to show just the acceptable sand. Models such as this can be converted to Boolean or true-false grids of zeros and ones which can be multiplied to show where everything is favorable or unfavorable. In this example, a limestone deposit is being evaluated where the calcium-magnesium ratio is acceptable and the magnesium oxide levels are acceptable and the calcium oxide levels are acceptable. This is the basis of multivariate spatial modeling. Block or solid modeling is the same idea as gridding, except the cells are three-dimensional voxels. It's sort of a Minecraft for geology. It took the guy on the left two years to create the physical model of a complex uranium deposit. It took a few seconds in RockWorks to create the model on the right. Another trick question, which one is better? Well, the model on the left is better. Here's why. That guy is constantly thinking, questioning, and double-checking the data before he starts cutting the plexiglass. And he's a real geologist with years of experience. Conversely, computer-generated modeling is fast and easy and it looks good. This tricks our brains into thinking that it's right just because it's pretty. The moral is to know your data and question your model. Solid modeling is why supercomputers were created. Quickly modeling 3D data takes some serious horsepower, but Intel has provided us with inexpensive multi-core processors on desktops and laptops. Consider this, however. The time required is determined by the number of voxels in the X direction, multiplied by the number of voxels in the Y direction, multiplied by the number of voxels in the z direction, multiplied by the number of wells, multiplied by the number of samples per well, which can be significant when modeling downhole geophysical points, multiplied by the number of time intervals if you're dealing with dynamic data. In other words, if you're doing big time-based modeling, buy a really good machine. Here's an example from one of our consulting projects in which dioxane levels from 814 wells were monitored over a 34-year period. RockWorks took nine hours to create 34 annual models. The RockWorks animation programs were then used to consolidate these models into a time-based animation. Now this is something which the guy making the plexiglass models could only dream of. The model on the left is based on 2D grids, while the model on the right is based on a 3D solid model. 
The terminology is confusing because the model on the left is displayed in 3D. So let's clarify the nomenclature. One-dimensional data refers to data in which there is one independent variable and one dependent variable, such as a graph depicting a stock value over time. Time is the independent variable and the stock price is the dependent variable. Sure, it can be plotted as a 3D diagram, but it's still based on one-dimensional data. Two-dimensional data refers to data in which there are two independent variables, such as longitude and latitude, and one dependent variable, such as the ground surface elevation. Three-dimensional data refers to data in which there are three independent variables, being x, y, and z, and one dependent variable called g, meaning grade. The challenge with geology is that you'll invariably need to use both 2D and 3D modeling. Consider this example. The ground surface, base of overburden, and top of bedrock are based on 2D grid models, whereas the permeability between the overburden and the bedrock is based on 3D solid or block modeling. This final slide provides some examples of modeling strategies based on what type of data you're using. When modeling simple layer cake stratigraphy, use gridding. If on the other hand you're modeling a unit that varies both vertically and horizontally, use solid modeling. The last and most common example at the bottom of this matrix involves lithologies that are laterally discontinuous but vertically isotropic thick lenses. For these types of problems, we use a special 3D modeling algorithm which we will address in detail during a future training webinar. Now if everybody's still awake, we'd be glad to answer any questions. We hope that you'll attend the next training webinar.